Yes, yes. Welcome to the ancient world of tabletop games. I am Agamemnon from the historical documentary Time Bandits. This is a report from a fugitive. I've featured glimpses of the world's largest dungeon in videos. Is it something you're likely to tackle? Let's suppose you like Dungeons and Dragons, and we'll go further into that supposition and take a wild guess. You like a good solid dungeon bash. As players are so fond of saying, there should be a dungeon with monsters in it and treasure at the end of it. If players had their way, there'd be a dungeon with treasure in it at every step, and maybe you'd arm wrestle a weedy goblin for possession of the loot. Little risk, vast reward, and I hate to say this, but players would leap at the chance to run through a no-risk dungeon, if only for purposes of low comedy. A no-risk dungeon. But the world's largest dungeon carries a great deal of risk, by that I mean in the purchasing of the damned thing. Let's put the lumbering beast into its historical context. This mighty tome has a clickbait title. It challenges you to play through its monster-laden passageways. This is the biggest dungeon in the history of bigness, and of dungeons, and of history. It goads gamers into gourmandry with gargantuan generosity. This is a dungeon containing all the things to excess, over 800 pages of excess and 16 giant-sized maps. Can you buy it anywhere? Yes. Should you? Fuck no. Do your research before delving into the past. This product was published in 2004, and larger works succeeded it. A creation like that could only ever be the world's largest anything for a short span of history. Placing the book in its year of publication doesn't stop the book from being a book. It is perfectly usable at a distance of a decade and more. You can run any D&D product from the history of the game, thanks to the internet's ability to keep different versions of the game alive. Granted, you'll be in for a spot of revision, modification, with the more obscure stuff, but the statement stands. You can run any D&D product from the history of the game. Why? There isn't a role-playing game out there that survived publication without players coming along and modifying material to suit their own needs. You can always make a dusty machine work if all you need is a bit of graft to remove that dust. If a game system doesn't work, tinker with it. Go over a rule, through a rule, or under a rule, and you'll discover your way on. Official products are officially yours to do with as you please. The game police are not about to kick your door down if you skip the encumbrance rules or ban wishes from your spellbook. D&D went into its third edition in the year 2000. The third edition underwent its own official modification in 2003 with the stuttering blip of version 3.5, a blatant cash grab about which we will not speak. Looking at fifth edition, I see players still create recognizable characters who quest for glory or do the right thing by the tenets of their people. The creatures have the same names and many of the same powers and abilities. And the treasure is still treasure. All those improbably named magic items survive from edition to edition, no matter the revamped nature of the operating system under the bonnet. You'll find ogres of giant boots in the monster manual, not in the Dungeon Master's Guide. And that is a role-playing fact. With a bit of work, you'll be more than capable of running the world's largest dungeon with 10th edition D&D from the comfort of your own brain chip. Also in the far-flung future, still no hover cars. Compatibility is not an issue. You could even run the dungeon with that red-headed stepchild of the RPG world, 4th edition D&D, about which we will not speak. When we bought the world's largest dungeon, that's exactly what we did. We bought it. 3rd edition rules sat there. We stared at the clickbait challenge. Well, it's the largest. It's ridiculous from page count to content. The price is ludicrous. As a group, we chipped coins into the party treasury and purchased a weighty tome that everyone knew I was going to run as an epic adventure. And as I said in the last video, we played half of the dungeon before players dispersed. We had a lot of fun with the crazy moments that players created inside a modular adventure. 
It's just a big dungeon, level after level, with a theme running through each level. At the end of the day, as well as at the start, it's a massive dungeon bash. With very little work, it's easy enough to break the whole book into chunks and run sessions based on individual maps. Should you buy the dungeon now, after the passage of years? Conversion to 5th edition is like any other conversion job, needs a bit of work, but every published adventure needs work anyway. You get the best deal out of the professional stuff if you tailor the official adventure to your players and their characters. If that means deviating from the official text, congratulations. What's wrong with buying it? The price, for one thing. I'm staring at an eBay listing, £96.3, with postage of £59.96. American postage is suspect, as we'll soon discover. But yes, that's from America. Used. And then the kick in the teeth. No maps. Seriously. The 16 posters that come with the book are essential to play. If they don't come with the book, you're forced to resort to archived files available free online. What a hardship, you say. It's like buying a car with a small print reading engine not included. The Amazon listings are a little better. £127.42 with £2.80 delivery. Next. £125 with £5.22 delivery. Good gravy. £130.22 for the dungeon, and delivery is free. Oh, bless. Keep going, £174.30 and another £5.22 for delivery from America. Curious that delivery from the USA varies from £5.22 now to £59.96 earlier. Next entry, a mere £144.01 with a delivery price tag of £85.31. Colour me stunned. Next, a suspiciously similar 85.31 postal fee with a slightly higher asking price of £423. Include me out. But the next two entries take all the biscuits. For a mere £980, you too can own the world's largest dungeon with free postage. The most expensive entry is the only one that states the product is new. Do they mean new in the sense that it sat in a vault untouched by the ravages of time for 15 years? We do not press the point, and it's not the cost that concerns the casual viewer. £1,087.99 for the dungeon. Gasp. How shocking. But wait a bit. Here's a kick to all the testicles. Plus £2.80 delivery. Well... I almost bought the copy, but they're asking 280 to send it out. Lost my custom right there. Wanted my free postage. What's the alternative? That's a trick question, but we'll try the straight answer. Go digital. The dungeon is available on Drive Through RPG for $39.95 as a cluster of digital downloads, maps included. Though I see some complaints about technical issues with the maps, I can't say if the problems were fixed since the complaints went in, and I'm not buying the dungeon digitally to find out, as I already have it here in its wood-based form. Those maps are available in one form or another elsewhere on the interwebs. Is it worth paying more in postage for the dungeon than we paid for the whole dungeon itself originally? Of course it isn't. What do you get out of a commercially available role-playing adventure? How do you determine worth? Any official RPG adventure is worth what you put into it to make it work as an adventure for your players. You adapt things, change them, invent a new series of character introductions, increase a threat here, alter a plot line there, and let the players run across the sand you've thrown in front of them. The tracks they leave behind tell the real story, long after the dice stop rolling and return to their boxes and bags. I have this vast book sitting in front of me. Sixteen maps, that's sixteen dungeons if I write enough alterations around the official text. But I'm not talking about this book specifically now. I'm saying there are games out there that are rare, out of print, gone except for a few overpriced copies online, and they are not worth buying. If you pick up an old game for the price of chocolate buttons and you resurrect that game with all sorts of alterations, you did well. What's the most expensive game in my collection? Though I have my suspicions, I don't know for sure. If I found out what it was and checked to see the asking price online, I'd laugh at that price. The value in a game comes from the play, from the players. 
In my last video on dead character sheets, I mentioned Kentucky Bill the Magnificent, also known as Kentucky Bill the Wondrous. What's a guy from Kentucky doing in a game of Dungeons and Dragons, you ask? Tolkien never cared for the idea of Santa Claus slaying his way across Narnia. We are more forgiving in dungeons that feature dragons. Kentucky Bill accidentally found himself separated from the rest of the party. This is a poor state of affairs at the best of times and a grim turn of events inside the largest of dungeons. He knew he was up against it and tried his damnedest to make his way back. But he strayed from one dungeon map to the next and things looked bleak for the lost wizard. His story became this endless spiral of doom as he jumped from one frying pan into the next over a series of blazing fires. He was toast. Certified dungeon approved toast, except for one thing. An item found in one part of the dungeon was useful in another part of the dungeon, if you happen to have it on prominent display. There should be a dungeon, check, with monsters in it, double check. And treasure? Well, treasure is something you pack away. Characters carry treasure in sacks, crates, boxes, buckets, you name it. For unfathomable reasons, characters, by which I mean players, don't like to flaunt the treasure while inside the dungeon. If a player finds a piece of jewellery, that item's monetary value is noted on a scrap of paper and the industrial vacuuming of the dungeon continues without skipping a beat. Loot is bagged and boxed. Move on. Kentucky Bill the Wondrous was made of different stuff. He found a piece of jewellery and wore it proudly as a symbol of his riches. And that random act... Contrary to the usual dungeon delving routines of players, why, that act hauled him out of the frying pan just as he realized he was very well done toast. Kentucky Bill the Wondrous was not only merely dead, he was really most sincerely dead. If I recall correctly, the exact quote was, I'm fucked, followed narratively by the old warhorse. With one mighty bound, our hero was free. Rarely had I seen a character so doomed in a game. Falling back from a creature's paralyzing attack with mighty wounds and four hit points left, his limbs stiffening and a pencil reaching to slash a line through the character sheet in the time-honored mark of death, Kentucky Bill fell into a teleporter and jumped into his last frying pan. When I described the place he ended up in, there was slight relief. Perhaps he'd be left alone long enough to recover from paralysis and find his way back to the main group. But no, I had to tell him of the giant monster in his face. Yet, his random action from earlier saved his life, which he couldn't believe. There he is, being carried by a giant beast of a so-called monster who is now his ally and bodyguard. Moments like that make the adventures come to life. I'll now return to that trick question. What's the alternative to paying huge amounts of money for the world's largest dungeon? The straight answer is to buy digitally, but the real answer is to write your own adventures. If you want to try Dungeons & Dragons, the 5th edition starter set will give you a good idea of what to expect, minus the nosebleed accompanying your purchase. A casual romp through the internet tells me it's comfortably available for under £20. Unless, of course, you are watching this video in the far-flung future, when the starter set for Ancient 5th edition will set you back three kidneys, two kidneys if you opt for the digital wet load only. Still no hover cars in the far-flung future, though. Take a look at professional publications. Tell yourself that rare material isn't worth the asking price. Type up your own adventures and print them out. If you're crap at drawing maps, find maps online. Are you rubbish at creating plots? Take inspiration from books and movies. There's nothing wrong in grabbing a cliche and putting it through the mincer to come up with an adventure. Give the players a base and put that base under siege. Throw a festival, an open-air celebration, and hit the town with an earthquake. Send your players to an auction and develop consequences from the wrong bidding actions. A reminder, I was involved in two RPG groups, an established group I was invited to join, and a group that I pretty much introduced to RPGs. The first group had a few resources, figures, floor plans, dice. That second group had to wing it until we went around the shops and mail-order outlets for equipment. I'd play a game with metal figures in one session and a game with wooden chess pieces in the other. You can sit at a table and gleefully not use anything beyond a character sheet, a pencil, a rubber and a few scraps of notepaper along with a set of dice. No one is forcing a gun to your head to make you buy the world's no longer largest but still hefty dungeon for a thousand pounds or more. What you can't afford, you make up. That's vital in a game about imagination.